Hi, folks. It's John Kraska, Executive Director for Every Library and the Every Library Institute with another edition of our uh, Utah State Library trainings uh, for 2022-2023. This one is about emergency emerging policy issues. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing with you some interesting new things that are coming out um, and, and some established projects as well from the federal government in particular uh, that might help you with some of your funding options for library services programs, staffing even, and uh, facilities. So let me get, let me jump in for you. Um, of course, we're here from every library and the Every Library Institute to help bring our experiences uh, to this conversation for, for library leaders in uh, Utah. The work that we do at every library is two parts. One is our, uh, our, our 501c3 organization. It's our political action committee for libraries. We work a lot on the funding formula for libraries. We got to the voters. We uh, talked to elected officials. But when you get right down to it, I want to find the smoothest, e easiest pathways to bring in the funding that libraries need. Uh, and sometimes that is through more of a policy focused approach. Um, how do we get libraries into these funding formulas from this, the federal government in particular? We also have our nonprofit 501c3 side, the Ever Library Institute. That's where these trainings are originating from right now, which is working on tax policy and public matters of public policy. In particular, how do we see libraries get into these funding formulas in a way that helps uh, extend or even sustain the work that you're trying to get done for your communities? Uh, this uh, program itself is part of your strategic planning priorities uh, uh, training from the State Library. Um, we're trying to root this as, as best we can into your uh, the rubrics that are necessary for uh, from the Utah State Library for library leaders to do proper planning, uh, both strategic planning and long range pl planning, the taxpayer resource conversation. Uh, and there's an awful lot in, in this process around uh, the development of your annual plans and the evaluation of the work that you're, you're doing. Uh, we are rooting it in standard number three in particular around uh, how library boards and leadership teams are charged with uh, with doing the long range planning process. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today from a, a policy perspective is uh, how do we potentially utilize funds from out of town, um, from not our own local tax base, and even not from the state of Utah itself in order to, to um, work on your technology your staffing, your uh, facilities needs as well. So let me uh, share, let me stop, uh, stop my video, get out of your way, and we can talk a little bit more about what the particulars are. Uh, so this is, I'm gonna be covering some ground here around uh, uh, out of school time for public libraries, uh, literacy services, uh, and some additional uh, resources around technology that I think might be very interesting to you. First off, I wanna begin with the summer and out of school time conversation. Um, there's a tremendous amount of activity that's done by libraries, uh, public libraries around summer reading, summer learning, um, a tremendous amount of activity that happens with the, the, uh, the, the whole uh, way that we structure. I mean, there's, there's really three seasons in the public library calendar, there's preparing for summer reading, there's summer reading, and there's cleaning up after summer reading. And yet we're not necessarily properly resourced for our activities that focus on this important gap period for students and families. Likewise, there is a tremendous amount of activity that, that takes place for, for public libraries when it comes to before school, after school, and out of school. And again, we tend to self-fund those activities. I wanna share with you today a, a, a different framework perhaps for funding um, that would be based in some resources that the federal government provides through the Department of Education in a program called the 21st Century Learning Centers. These 21st Century Learning Center um, grant programs are designed to help uh, students with academic enrichment, tutoring services, um, the the uh, social emotional learning, uh, safety outside of school time. It's intended to help uh, hold people, hold kids at grade level, um, and also to um, help support new skills development. Um, it covers the arts, it covers music, it covers technology, it's recreation. Uh, there are a number of different angles to this. And unfortunately, in your state and in my state, 
public libraries are not really in the mix when it comes to funding the funding formula for 21st century learning centers. Now, if you've looked into this before, you'll know that there's an important caveat, which is that funding has to flow for 21st century learning centers programs through local education agencies, an LEA. Uh, that's a fancy term for a school district, but it can flow to community-based organizations, tribes, and other public entities and private entities. And public entity here, folks, includes public libraries. This is intended to be collaboration between school districts and these other organizations. Now, who are they right now? Boys and Girls Clubs. It is sports and parks and rec. It is uh, after school tutoring programs. It is uh, job skills or even small work uh, force uh, type, type projects. It's a lot of what is being done here is around uh, uh, both uh, remedial as well as advanced literacies. I believe um, this very firmly when I say this to you, we are shovel ready in public libraries in the state of Utah and my state and 48 other places to be a part of this 21st century learning center framework, but we have not been successful or maybe we've not even been focused on, on looking at this as a, the potential best way in the world to, to, to fund summer reading, uh, to fund before school, after school and out of school time activities. Um, now, you have to start working with this uh, from the perspective of the pre-screened 21st century uh, community learning centers, external organizations, which are part of every state, including yours. Uh, it's very important that the collaboration is the focus. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of, of coaching that's available for uh, collaborative programs like summer learning and enrichment. Um, some of the best that's out there right now is coming from the nonprofit network, the nonprofit 50 state after school network from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. Now, again, I'm not just looking to drop anything on your lap and walk away. Uh, the chance to be able to help you think through uh, an opportunity to collaborate more closely, not just programmatically, but in a funded, focused way with your local schools on this out of school, after school, before school, and summer learning time. I think it's a real asset. You're already spending a tremendous amount of time and attention on these programs. We we should be doing it in a way that is funded, uh, at, that, that allows you to scale up what you're doing um, and do it in close collaboration, uh, really wraparound services for the whole life of the child and their families. All right. Literacy and workforce is another area where your library, uh, every single library that I work with, uh, spends a lot of time focusing on literacy services for, for adults uh, in particular and for, for uh, first language literacy acquisition, for immigrant populations, for remedial literacy skills, for people um, who, who need to, to be able to, uh, well, have a, a functional literacy framework in order to, to take a job and keep a job. The single biggest funder for literacy services in the United States of America is not a private foundation or philanthropy. It's the U.S. Department of, of Labor uh, through the Literacy and Workforce Act. Um, the, I'm sorry, the Workforce Innovation Act. Um, the Workforce Innovation Act, uh, Title II, is set up to, to do uh, a tremendous amount of funding in order to get people to the place where they can take a job, keep a job, get the next job, Literacy services, uh, the federal government has known for, for a long time that, that having a literacy service focused um, approach to workforce development is essential to moving people off of poverty and into their own self-determination. So, uh, Title II of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, uh, Section 203 there, describes eligible providers of literacy services as organizations that demonstrate effectiveness in providing adult education and literacy activities, Libraries are already pre-qualified as eligible providers, and uh, no offense, we're not making the grant applications, uh, we're not making the policy-focused decisions in order to, to um, uh, get the funding that we need to move our projects forward. Eligible providers, which includes libraries, have to demonstrate effectiveness by providing performance data. So sometimes we are hesitant, perhaps, to apply for something like this. For lack of data, great, I understand that. One of the requirements that the Utah State Library has for, for evaluations is to get better data. This is an opportunity to dovetail 
the work that you're already doing, um, measuring the impacts and outcomes of your, your literacy programs in a way that's modelable for additional inputs from Department of Labor. You have to be in a position to meet adults where they're at with their low le levels of literacy. There's tutoring and other support services across reading, writing, and math, English language acquisition folks. The amount of funding that is available is astronomical around, across the country. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of, of $720 million a year focused on, on um, everything in those rubrics. And your library, libraries across the state of, of Utah and in 49 other places should be in that eligible provider framework receiving the funding to do these kinds of services. That funding can go to uh, programs, collections, and staffing. And um, it is uh, this, one of the single biggest ways that your library could be participating in economic development activities. Right now in the state of Utah, the uh, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act um, plan, because every state's required to do uh, a plan, that plan is available at schools.utah.gov slash adult education. I know it's the workforce development uh, funding that comes from Department of Labor, but where it goes through in terms of Department of Ed in Utah, in I think 32 states, um, it's administered by the Department of Education because we're talking about adult education and family literacy. It's all good. But basic adult education, I'm sorry, adult basic education and integrated English literacy and civics education funding if I could ask you to want to do one thing today, besides the 21st Century Learning Center collaborations with school districts at, at a scalable, fundable way, is to take a look in, into what the priorities are for the state of Utah around workforce innovation and see how your local library can map across the regions of Utah into those, the, those priorities. Um, there's a tremendous amount of support potentially available, but we have to get ourselves shovel ready for it. Every library and the Every Library Institute are here to help you figure that out as well. The, I'm sorry, the Utah activities here on the, on the, uh, the state plan, uh, adult education literacy activities reads like a dossier of what libraries want to be doing. And I'm sure that yours maps to this very clearly. This is a, oh, I think it's a 254 page plan for the state of Utah. I would highly recommend spending some time with it to understand uh, priorities, the fundable nature of your work, and to be able to, to walk back from what you're already trying to accomplish, but with a funding focused framework attached to it, so much the better. All right, there's a few other federal programs I wanna highlight for you in this conversation to see if there's uh, it sparks anything with you about where funding can come to help you with your strategic priorities. Um, I'm not going to talk about earmarks in this section, and I'm not going to talk about broadband. I'll come back around to that in a few minutes and both of those. What I want to talk about is initially uh, the community block grant development funds, as well as the, the um, U.S. Department of Ag rural development funds. Community block grants uh, predate any of the ARPA money uh, that it came through uh, around the pandemic. It, it is uh, basically the structure of how um, ARPA was funding municipalities, uh, whether it's uh, town, cities, or counties. The, the policy issue here fundamentally is that uh, libraries are not directly eligible in a community block grant development system um, or the community block grant development program, but your municipalities are, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the funding formula for um, urban defined uh, you know, based on your on on, on your uh, community, this is a, again for urban centers. Um, the formula for allocations is around um, improvements to public services activities, housing, improving public facilities, and economic development activities. I would suggest that aside from housing, though, in some places around the country, we're seeing mixed use library developments where you'll have say senior housing attached to a, a, a library facility as an anchor tenant. But aside from housing, you know, the way it's being used, generally speaking in community black grant development programs around the country, public services activities, improving public facilities and economic development activities um, are right in line with the library's uh, mission and provision of services. If you have not had a conversation yet with your city 
about your municipality, about community block grant development funds, and how they could be allocated to the library to advance the overall uh, mission of the community, this is a wonderful time to be able to do it because the ARPA funding that your municipalities have had is probably taking care of the majority of projects that were backlogged in a, in a CDGB framework. And they're gonna all say CDG, CDBG with you. So get used to saying the acronym quickly. This is a great, a great time right now to start looking ahead at priorities that have, have gone potentially unfunded with the library and are eligible for these activities because they fit the goals around public services activities, improving public facilities and economic development activities within, within your urban defined areas. If you're not urban defined, that's cool too. We, the, uh, the USDA, US Department of Agriculture, has two significant programs around community facilities that I'd like to direct your attention to. Uh, both of them are uh, based on loans. One of them is the Direct Loans and Grants Program, and the other is the Facilities Loans Guarantee Program. US uh, Department of Ag right now and the, uh, the Rural Development uh, Agency is looking to spend money they're looking to spend money in rural defined communities on community infrastructure. Uh, that's facilities, it's improvements to existing facilities, it's building new places. Uh, they're looking at both horizontal and vertical, uh, meaning that, you know, can we expand the place? Can we do weatherization? Can we do uh, environmental upgrades? Can we do uh, energy efficiencies? And can we, can we stand something up? Um, because the infrastructure, the built environment um, is what they're focusing on with, in, in the current um, plan of service. The facilities are physical structures, and they're also, they also talk about, and this is kind of an interesting thing in the, the loan guarantee area, it's not just physical structures, it's the services provided to residents or businesses. Now, I'm not trying to be too nuanced here, and there's a lot of technical issues that go into a grant, ap or a grant application or a loan guarantee program, but if the priorities of your county, if the priorities of your, your rural defined area include um, you know, ways to reach folks uh, in a built environment, the funding exists without necessarily having to go out and bond for it. Um, there are occasional occasions where matching programs need to be made. Um, and at the same time, this is the lowest interest rate that you're going to find even in an inflationary, an inflationary period for the commercial loan market. All right, another program, community blank block grants were, were HUD money. It's it's defined for, for urban. Uh, U.S. Uh, rural Development Agency, of course, were rural defined. U.S. Department of Energy right now is, is funded to a tremendous degree on energy efficiency and conservation programs. This block grant program, it's set up to do state uh, level block grants as well as local government and tribal block grants. And it's about energy use. It's about energy efficiency. It's about weatherization. It's about the green economy. Folks, there is a, a really strong opportunity. And again, this is a policy conversation as much as anything else because to put libraries into this uh, space is to show in, in Utah, it's easier than some other states, that the uh, leverage that comes from working with your municipalities, um, that, that, that point of policy has already been taken care of in, in Utah. Uh, if you're in another state like Illinois, where I'm from, you have independent districts, it's much harder uh, to, to access these kinds of funds in an independent district, but as a department of local government. If you have a need for or an interest in clean energy infrastructure, please take a, a look at this. Um, the, the, there, there are, um, this is an unprecedented time for this, this type of, of green economy activity. FEMA is another uh, area of government that has received a, a significant amount of funding coming through ARPA uh, in terms of disaster uh, relief, as well as disaster mitigation. Uh, FEMA has uh, a state level uh, grant program that is worth taking a look at as a local library to get bundled up with around building resilient infrastructure. These community grant programs that they have are intended to essentially pre-mitigate hazard and risk um, 
and that is to public infrastructure as well as to disadvantaged communities. FEMA already looks at, from a policy perspective, libraries as being uh, part of the disaster mitigation uh, infrastructure. But this program in particular, again, it's a state program, it's not local, but as a state program could help fund the uh, build outs that you need, the, 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 um, um, the aspects of, of both your technology as well as your, as your built environment for your libraries to help be more, to help communities be more resilient in the face of disaster. That's also focusing though on climate resilience and adaptation, which has a different event horizon than say a flood or a fire. The climate resilience and adaptation aspects of the FEMA grant um, are intended to help um, community-based organizations and public infrastructure get ahead of these, these issues. Again, this is a state program, but taking a look at, at it from, from the perspective of how can the library, which, is, which will be there uh, as part of the built environment of our, of our, of our communities, um, how can the library uh, receive, um, or I'm sorry, how can the library uh, realize its mandate to help people in times of crises? There's another aspect of, of, uh, of federal funding that I want to bring to you now, which is really around um, the funding that's come out of the Infrastructure and Jobs Act around green, uh, not just technologies, but green fleets. There's a, 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 a giant pile of money for schools right now that's not here on the screen, but schools to do um, electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles for their uh, school bus fleets. There's a lot of lot of green opportunities for K-12 uh, to do that important, currently diesel operated um, transportation network in, a, in green technology. Same thing goes for municipal buses, whether the, you're the full size or the mini buses. There's a tremendous amount of funding support available uh, for green fleets though, that can be used around, um, potentially used around mobile library services and bookmobiles, as well as those other, other types of programs I'm describing. It's mainly because the federal programs are designed to help municipalities change the, um, their own fleets from uh, gas powered or diesel powered to electric. The library is, as a department of local government, potentially eligible to have your mobile and bookmobile services subsidized, underwritten in this green fleet technology conversion. Um, there's not a specific earmark there for bookmobiles or for libraries, unfortunately. So it's going to have to be a situation where there's a, an element of, of uh, creativity, but there's a straight line between saying that the acquisition of a bookmobile, uh, the next generation of our mobile library services um, in our city library should be in a green framework um, and uh, applying for and receiving this type of, of federal uh, subsidy. Okay, so those types of, of, of uh, federal programs uh, have um, a current framework. You could apply for them, you know, on an ongoing basis or on an annual basis now. Uh, community Black Grant Developments and Rural um, Development Agency funds are on an annual cycle. The FEMA money is on, a, is on an annual cycle. The other green fleet programs have different, different aspects to them. What I want to talk about now is money that will be coming for broadband and digital equity uh, in 2020, beginning in 2024. Right now, where we sit at the beginning of 2023, the, the uh, states are still um, developing their comprehensive plans for uh, broadband deployment, which is what the BEAD program is, and Digital Equity Act uh, spending, which is where, where uh, a lot of library services can potentially be um, funded in that kind of framework. So this is anticipatory, folks, as opposed to um, uh, current fiscal year, next fiscal year. The funding for, for um, broadband deployment and for Digital Equity Act will be around for several years to come as well. The structure of the 
Infrastructure and Jobs Act, um, which passed quite a long time ago, the money still has not really been moving yet for broadband. All the broadband deployment money that's been coming out has been coming from uh, essentially ARPA, actually some of us some of it's CARES Act uh, era money, and then it's ARPA money. What we're moving into though, again, in the beginning of 2024, based on state planning processes that are happening now, are new funding uh, for um, eligible programs and libraries are part of that mix. The BEAD program, which is the Broadband Equity and Deployment Act, provides uh, $42 billion towards broadband infrastructure, including anchor institutions. That number is ridiculously large. But the anchor institution definition there is libraries. Um, and that includes health, it includes schools, it includes other community-based organizations that fit the anchor definition. Um, if you've taken a webinar before about, about the BEAD program and Digital Equity Act, you will have heard this before, which is that we have to be working with our cities and our states to get ourselves into a position where that, that funding is more than just a, a potential eligibility, it's a straight line to what we need to accomplish. <laughs> Excuse me. The Digital Equity Act funding is a separate pool. It's $2.75 billion, which is still a giant pile of money. It's almost absurdly large. But what it does um, is it provides services through competitive grant programs to um, states as well as to local institutions like libraries around digital equity. Digital equity uh, could also be called digital opportunity. It could be called uh, navigator programs. It could be called uh, uh, projects that put um, uh, hotspots into every home and then how do you use them. The, the Digital Equity Act resources are going to be very extensive. And the only way that libraries are gonna be uh, eligible uh, beyond the abstract is to make sure that we're integrated in local plans and state plans so that when the funding arrives, we are, we are ready to be able to apply for and receive those grant programs that could extend for several years and cover staffing as well as hardware and software. There's an, there's an aspect of, of the, pro, of the uh, digital programs that within the BEAD framework that I want to br bring up as well called the uh, middle mile which is essentially a situation where um, how close to the internet are you uh, as a library? Uh, some libraries are at the far end of the internet. By the time they, they by, by the time the, the fiber optic gets to you, or it's cable, or it's or or there's no physical connection stronger than like a DSL still. Um, how, there, there's money available from the federal government to states to make sure that uh, community anchor institutions like libraries. Are well, they'll bring the, the 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 backbone of the internet to you. Now, again, that isn't done casually; it has to be planned for. So, your library needs to be on the FCC map for this, and you have to be in a position to lobby local and state uh, uh, broadband officials to make sure that any sort of shortfall is addressed in this middle mile kind of program to make sure that your library is as close as it can be to the backbone of the internet. Likewise, tribal connectivity for any, sorry, tribal broadband connectivity, anyone who's serving uh, a tribal, tribal lands or tribal communities needs to be dialed in on how this particular and unique uh, level of funding can go to establish digital equity and digital opportunity for those populations. There's quite a long timeline between now and uh, where we're at. We're right at the beginning of the 2023 cycle. Money moves on this, not until really 2024, and it keeps going for several years to come. There's a there's a, there's a, a several years long implementation, four years, five years kind of event horizons here, folks. The funding for digital equity in particular will put a tremendous amount of resources available to qualified libraries. And what qualifies your library is that the state broadband plan, the state digital equity plan, includes the type of activities that you want to see done in that plan. There's funding to, to cover training programs and administration, everything from basic to advanced digital skills, digital navigators, which have been used to a certain extent in successfully already in Utah libraries, you guys have been leading the way. How do you scale that up? 
um, that local workforce development rubric that you want to be able to uh, to, to, to spend on. Um, as long as there's a digital lens for it and that the state plan is, is ready to receive your activity, you're very eligible for, for sustaining grants. Again, this, isn't, this is not only hardware and software. It's not only programmatic activity, it's staffing as well. I would suggest that everyone should be evaluating, evaluating their options around construction and upgrades and expanding your public access computing as well. Uh, the hardware side of it, like I said, it's not just the hardware, but the hardware drives a lot of your success. Middle mile within the BEAD program, again, connecting community anchor institutions to the, the internet backbone, the Digital Equity Act funding that is about services and programs technology, um, and the chance to advance digital opportunity or digital equity, and then the tribal broadband programs that are out there for, uh, for build outs, as well as the digital equity, digital opportunity programs in that tribal, on that tribal land context. There's a few specific programs that I would ask you to take a look at uh, to see where you could best be preparing at the beginning of 2023 for eventual success in 2024 and beyond. This is a cooperative effort. Um, your state library is, is very well dialed into this. And your participation at the very local level would be extremely helpful to see systems move forward. And it, in the enlightened self-interest framework, to have the right kind of funding come to your particular community. All right, I got two more areas to talk about with this emerging policy uh, conversation. One is federal earmarks are back. And the other is uh, something that's kind of interesting, which is the uh, 250th anniversary of the United States of America. So on the earmark side, uh, those of you who are of a certain age will remember uh, pork barrel spending and earmarks. They were outlawed several years ago. They're back. And they are uh, starting to pay off for libraries around the country directly. Uh, in the 2022-2023 uh, cycle, um, the, um, the congressional directed spending, sorry, 2022-2023 uh, fiscal years saw a fair amount of funding come directly to library programs within the pro within the the frameworks that both the Senate and the House have about what is called not earmarks but on the Senate side congressionally directed spending. It's a euphemism for earmarks. They function very much the same ways. Likewise, on the House side, they're called community project funding. They are earmarks. Um, a member of Congress can direct part of the federal budget to that activity. Um, it's important to note that there's some rules around it though that might not have been in place back in the pork barrel spending days. You have to work with your congressional delegation, but 1% of the entire federal budget is dedicated to these well, earmark programs. Generally speaking, eligible projects uh, are funded in the same way a competitively awarded project is, meaning that if you want to get something done that would come through, uh, say, um, the, the Department of Health and Human Services around telehealth, um, you would have to follow the rules of that program as if it was part of your, your federal uh, competitive grant program. And if there are uh, any requirements for state or local matches, you need to be able to bring those to it. Likewise, the, the earmark is only intended to be utilized for one fiscal year, though some things can carry over into another fiscal year. That said, what we have here is, is a opportunity. Well, in one place in, that, I, that I know pretty intimately in Delaware, the State Library of Delaware, in conjunction with, three, with four libraries, um, put together an earmark request to telehealth booths, like I was describing, and um, it's amazing what happens when when your your congressional delegation says yes. The 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 funding was otherwise unavailable. Uh, there wasn't anything in the state uh, locally. There wasn't anything going on that was going to make that happen. That initiative that they seized around earmarks is the difference between having that sort of long term uh, infrastructure in place and it being absent. I would highly recommend it. Our, our friends over at NACO, the National Association of Counties, has a good explainer on how this whole thing works. Many times um, in, in your context, I mean, every time in your context, it's gonna have to be in conjunction with either a municipal partner uh, with your city or your, your counties. Um, 
because you're not an independent district, but to make sure that the funding flows uh, is to talk with your congressional delegation about their priorities for your particular part of Utah. All right, here's my wrap, my last thing. America in 2026 will be celebrating its 250th anniversary. And I feel like it was just the bicentennial the other day. But 250th means that there's going to be a, a fair amount of new funding coming from the federal government, largely through the National Endowment for the Humanities is how it's being projected right now. But there might be some through IMLS as well, um, maybe through NEA. But fundamentally, with a with a, a, a historic retrospective happening, there's going to be a lot of things uh, in a lot of places that are, are funded through the National Endowment for the Humanities because National Endowment for the Humanities funds national archives and records. Ex exhibits, whether they're permanent or temporary or traveling, funding for historic places. And some of the libraries in Utah are more historic than others, but every place has uh, value for the, uh, the story of Utah. Uh, discussions around the humanities, digitization of local history, digital asset management, the issues around how do we make sure that, that we're not forgetting by losing the paper copy, uh, and the opportunity to work on local archives to make sure that the local archive has more uh, integrity in, in its physical space, its environmental, uh, um, um, the, the envelope of the building. So I would like to recommend that in the lead up to the, the 250th in 2026, that we pay attention to making sure that libraries, your library in particular, uh, has access to funds that will allow for the uh, preservation and extension of access to your local history. All right, team. That was the whole thing. Let me bring it back to you here, because what we want, the whole reason to talk about this is to see where our priorities are when it comes to our strategic planning process. How do we have a diverse uh, funding stream beyond the local. Um, yes, there's there's conversations to be had about um, improving your budget framework. That's been previous webinars. There'll be some of the webinars upcoming. But this opportunity to leverage um, resources that come from outside. Um, yes, the, the resources that come from inside are new taxes. They are cuts to existing other programs or reallocations that to other from other programs to your program. But the, the funding that can come from outside in terms of new money uh, is a key element of your ability to, to, to not only plan effectively, but to, to dream big. Well, folks, it was nice to be able to chat with you a little bit today. Again, I'm John Kraska with Every Library and the Every Library Institute. We're not just asking you to, to do this on your own. If there's an opportunity to help you think this through and to put together more successful programs, we'd like to be at the table with you. I look forward to talking to you in the next webinar. In the meantime, though, be well. Thanks again.